Welcome back. My name is Tom Grieve. I'm a former state prosecutor and criminal defense attorney in the great state of Wisconsin. I wanted to take some time and to do a quick video talking about a major case that really isn't on a lot of people's radars called Buchanan versus City of San Jose. It came out in 2019. It has everything to do with the reactionary gap, sometimes called the 21 foot rule, which came out in 1983 from an article published by Lieutenant Dennis Tuller. I want to take some time to unpack this case and to really make sure that people have a proper understanding of what the actual reactionary gap is, why the 21 foot rule probably isn't an appropriate way of thinking about it and is certainly not an appropriate way of discussing it. The United States Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals very nearly turned the often referenced but far less often understood 21 foot rule from a law enforcement principle with specific presumptive application into an actual broad-based self-defense law. If you do not know what the 21-foot rule is, what very nearly happened to potentially alter the legal landscape of self-defense laws nationwide in one of our nation's highest courts, and why I believe that the 21-foot rule may not apply to you, then this video is for you. To move forward and understand why the court nearly got this so very wrong, we first need to briefly visit the origin of the 21-foot rule. In the March 1983 issue of SWAT magazine, a Utah police trainer, Lieutenant Dennis Tuller, shared an extraordinary discovery in his article, How Close is Too Close, that he made while training law enforcement officers on the range. An officer asked, when it came to an edged weapon attacker, how close is too close? Tuller found that he did not have a great answer and devised an experiment to help him find that answer. He found that an average trainee could draw and fire two shots center mass in approximately the same time that it takes an average adult male to cross 21 feet from a standing start, each in a case of about 1.5 seconds. The simulations meant that an armed assailant with a knife or any dangerous hand weapon could reach and thereby potentially wound or even kill an officer when within 21 feet before that officer could draw from a holster and fire what was presumed to be an attacker stopping two shots center mass. Plainly stated, a bad guy with a hand weapon within 21 feet may be able to physically and perhaps lethally assault an officer before that officer could react to stop them. It is also worth noting that even officers who were able to fire twice within 1.5 seconds were often still wounded by the attacker in a fair portion of the training simulations. The discovery of this information, previously hiding in plain sight, immediately advanced both law enforcement thinking and training by establishing the time and distance that a reaction can catch up to an action and thereby revealing the so-called reactionary gap. However, far more often this principle has been codified simply as the 21-foot rule. You may have also heard of what trainers now call the Tula drill. The Tuller drill, which was not created by Lieutenant Tuller, despite bearing his namesake, involves a drawing of a handgun from a holster and putting two shots center mass in a quick and safe manner as possible. The idea here is that the trainee is practicing their reactionary gap training, because the faster someone can safely draw and fire two shots center mass, then presumably the smaller reactionary gap the trainee has and the safer they become. If an individual can draw and place two shots center mass in one second or 1.3 seconds, then by shrinking the time that they are likewise shrinking the distance that it takes for them to react. Remember that at the end of the day, someone acting always has the advantage over someone reacting due to the time delay spent recognizing an action, creating a plan to counter, then executing the counter strategy. The Tula drill at least helps to shrink the time to deploy a firearm and lethal force as a reaction strategy. Many folks, by thinking simply of the 21-foot rule, have forgotten or were perhaps never even taught in the first place the actual principle that it speaks to, the reactionary gap. This has led to a lot of confusion and, frankly, training malpractice to create another inferred rule that hand weapons only within 21 feet present a deadly threat. Others have also seriously misunderstood the reactionary gap in the opposite, though also grossly incorrect direction, to mean that all use of deadly force against such armed attackers inside 21 feet is somehow automatically legal. This set the stage for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to weigh in. In San Jose, a 911 caller falsely reported that a man armed with a knife was menacing his family. 
It later would be learned that the caller, Mr. Philip Watkins, was in fact the same man who was armed with that knife and was intentionally committing so-called suicide by cop. When officers arrived at the man with the knife call, they saw Mr. Watkins standing outside the address while armed with a knife next to two women. At this time, the officers were approximately 130 feet away. Upon seeing the officers, Mr. Watkins immediately began rapidly advancing towards them in a threatening manner while ignoring their repeated commands to stop. Importantly, some of the facts are still disputed by the parties, even to this day. However, the court in its decision noted that within a few short seconds after Mr. Watkins began rapidly advancing, which is code for running by the way, both officers began opening fire. The officers opened fire at a distance of approximately 55 feet and Mr. Watkins collapsed of his fatal wounds at approximately 18 feet from the officers. The officers were sued in civil court and a major issue in the case was whether the use of deadly force beyond 21 feet against a knife armed attacker automatically equates to excessive deadly force. The plaintiffs, this was Mr. Watkins' girlfriend who sued the police, claimed that among other assertions, the use of deadly force was unjustifiable because Mr. Watkins posed no immediate threat due to being beyond 21 feet at the time when the officers began firing. The trial court ruled in summary judgment in favor of the two officers and the plaintiff's girlfriend appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, thereby creating the case of Buchanan versus City of San Jose. In the interest of staying on topic, I am purposefully leaving out some of the plaintiff's factual and legal claims raised in their case, such as the officers not utilizing lesser, non-deadly force, and so forth, since this is a discussion of the reactionary gap principle. If the plaintiffs had prevailed on appeal, it may have been up to a jury on remand to the trial court to decide the exact meaning of the 21-foot rule and the reactionary gap. For additional details on case specifics, including all the plaintiff's claims, assertions, please see the court ruling and each party's pleading. Some of those links are in the description box below. The officers won the case on the appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court with one dissenting opinion. Among the issues raised within the dissenting judge's ruling, who would have seen the case go for the plaintiff, was whether the 21-foot rule adopted by the San Jose's Police Department's training protocols created a legal presumption against the use of deadly force outside of 21 feet when faced by an edge weapon attacker. It is important to note that we are discussing a legal presumption of when deadly force can be used and that all presumptions are ordinarily open to rebuttal by other evidence and testimony at trial. If the dissent had been the majority, the issue may have gone to a jury with widespread reverberations for the firearm training community hanging on the outcome. In essence, the court may have endorsed the position that firearms, as a general rule, cannot be used against hand weapons like knives when beyond 21 feet. It is long overdue to be more specific about the 21-foot rule, to clean up the record, and to fix the misunderstood perceptions. The most significant piece of information to come from Lieutenant Tuller's article is the establishment of the reactionary gap, not some kind of distance rule that must apply to all officers at all times under all circumstances. Rather than referring to this as the 21-foot rule, I would humbly suggest that it be rebranded simply as the reactionary gap, or something that speaks much more accurately to the principle rather than the potentially irrelevant pre-designated distance of 21 feet that came with a lot of conditions. Recall exactly how we arrived at the 21-foot rule almost 30 years ago on a well-lit Utah range day. It was found by how long it took to draw and fire two shots with trained officers against an identified stationary threat identified weapon with perfect target isolation and from an open carry draw position. This very much is not the same deadly threat encountered by officers in the streets under most circumstances. I would also strongly contend that a 21-foot rule is even less applicable to concealed carriers across the country who face a far more difficult and therefore longer draw motion from a concealed carry holster or other position, potentially creating many distinguishing factors. To be clear, I very much doubt and it is by no means my implication that Lieutenant Tuller would suggest a 21-foot rule should be understood as a magic shoot or no-shoot barrier. In fact, Lieutenant Tuller himself has referred to the so-called 21-foot rule as a, quote, bastardized term, and has instead referenced the totality of the circumstances as a far more controlling and a better way of measuring what distance might be appropriate to use force. So what does this all mean for the responsibly armed citizen? 
The inescapable truth remains that a draw from a concealed holster, often under multiple layers of clothing, and for those of us in the north, a large winter jacket may cause a significant lag behind the 1.5 seconds that it took to draw when compared to open carrying officers on a warm summer day. Trainers and carriers alike need to recognize the dueling reality that concealed carriers are exposed to a larger reactionary gap while simultaneously requiring tremendous caution and drawing their sidearm unless absolutely necessary. Keep in mind that unless you are facing a deadly threat in certain jurisdictions, the mere act of producing your firearm may lead to your arrest for criminal charges. If you point your firearm in the direction of someone without sufficient legal reason, then you will almost certainly face criminal charges. This difficult and high stakes reality confronting the concealed carrier necessitates an extraordinarily high level of both education and training to understand their reactionary gap and how to navigate that within the long shadow of the law. This is all precisely the reason why that R word, rule, must be written out of the training vocabulary. Because this is not, and it cannot be, an inelastic bright line test. The facts of real cases are typically disputed to one degree or another, and hard rules with no room for exception are rarely, if ever, appropriate. Every case must always be judged by the applicable legal standards in that jurisdiction, objective reasonableness, and of course by the totality of the circumstances, among other factors. However, it is clearly not outside the realm of consideration that this training term, the so-called 21-foot rule, almost migrated its way into becoming law. Something must be immediately done to pivot the training vocabulary and save the principle from the so-called rule. All of this is, of course, also not mentioning the fact that, unlike in Hollywood, when someone is shot in real life, they do not automatically fall to the ground and stop becoming a threat. There are numerous case studies where attackers, aided by drugs or simply adrenaline, have fought through their own sometimes fatal wounds long after being shot repeatedly to kill their victims. In fact, according to the U.S. Department of Justice and FBI Firearms Training Unit research, even after being shot in the heart and thereby stopping blood circulation, it has been demonstrated that attackers can still voluntarily act for 10 to 15 seconds with the use of stored oxygen in their brain before succumbing. If we remember that an attacker starting from a standing position, as proposed by Lt. Tuller in 1983, can cover 21 feet in 1.5 seconds, then how much distance can be covered to deliver a knife attack in those 10 to 15 seconds utilizing the stored oxygen in the brain? Well, one study referenced in the description box below that looked into this exact question concluded that such an attacker could cover about 210 feet or 70 yards. In other words, most of a football field. It is safe to say that 210 feet is going to be well outside of the common ranges that most people find themselves in when dealing with lethal force self-defense encounters, not to mention their own effective range of hitting a moving target with a self-defense sidearm. This is even further compounded when considering that low-light incidents account for as much as 85% of officer-involved shootings in large metropolitan areas. Again, citation in the description box below. Finally, bearing all the above in mind, the lethality of an easily hidden and commonly carried edged weapon like a folding pocket knife or even a fixed blade three to five inches in length cannot be understated. A study from the United Kingdom actually found that a significant percent of edged weapon attacks actually result in a fatal wound from a single slash or stab. The accumulative effect of the studies and available information hardly even touched upon here paints a compelling picture that neither law enforcement and especially not the responsibly armed American should be bound by an ironclad 21-foot rule. The facts from the Court of Appeals case in Buchanan saw two officers combining their firepower from full-size service weapons, and it still required 37 feet to stop a potentially deadly threat. A 21-foot rule could arguably and foreseeably lead to serious injury or even death of one or both of the officers in this case, not to mention countless other officers and citizens alike in the around 1.2 million violent crimes that take place in the United States each year. Instead, the reactionary gap principle needs to be properly trained and discussed in the context of the facts and laws to appropriately capture the threat facing the victim in each specific instance. Shooters have been, and need to continue to be, taught the importance of movement and cover, along with target identity and isolation. These are all concepts that any decent self-defense class with a firearm should be covering in addition to the fundamentals of deadly force law.
Thanks for sticking around to the end of this video. If you like this content, please click the like button, and if you want to see more content like this, please consider subscribing to the channel. But now I want to hear from you. In the comments section below, what do you think about the 21-foot rule? What did it get right? What did it get wrong? And should normal concealed carry citizens, in other words, non-police officers, have some sort of different training or different rule?